Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. One more time. We made it through Easter, right? Some of us made it through unscathed. Others of us did not make it through unscathed. But I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing our first hymn this morning, Standing on the Promises of God. Let's sing in concert this morning. God, holy God, God of love, God of compassion, God that heals, God of righteousness and justice and forgiveness, God of peace, God of love. We are blessed, truly blessed that you are our God, that your eye is always on us. You know our heart. You fill us with your spirit. Help us today to be fully, fully, fully present to you as we worship you, as we praise you, as we sing, as we share, that we may receive and be touched and go out and make a difference in your world. Amen. 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 As we come, as we sing our next hymn, which is, It is Well. How great thou art. How great thou art. <laughs>
God, I ask you to be with us, speak to our hearts, because we need to hear a word from you on today. God, we thank you that you are in the midst of us, that you are here speaking to us like never before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You may, you may be seated. First of all, let me say, I'm getting kind of hollow, yeah. hollow here. Um, first of all, let me say that I appreciate your prayers um, that you all have and the love that you have given me. As you all have known that for the last few weeks, I have struggled on a bad foot. Now, I don't know if it's indicative of our healthcare system, but they told me I had gout. <laughs> and so they, they gave me a bunch of anti-inflammatory steroids medication, and my arthritis is feeling great, but, but my foot, <laughs> well, it didn't seem to be getting any better. And so I finally broke down. I went back to 
um, express care because to get into my primary care was about a three week wait. <laughs> so I went to express care and I saw a different physician's assistant. And she goes, are you sure you didn't enter it? And I said, well, not that I know of, but you know, anything is possible. She said, well, the room I'm in is right next door to the x-ray room. She said, let's get an x-ray just to rule out some stuff. And, and we, before then, we were talking about uric acid and all the things to take care of gout. And she comes back in the room with a smile on her face. She said, well, forget the uric acid test. <laughs> I said, why? She said, because your ankle's broke. <laughs> I said, okay. So that explains it, right? Why, why the medication wasn't work, working. So my ankle is broken. I'm going to be in a boot for six to eight weeks. I waiting for the orthopedic to, to get in touch with me. And um, it's my right foot, so I can't drive. So thank God for you all who are, who are helping, helping me out. Now, now that I got that out of the way, yeah. But one thing that I like to say in this church is we play hurt. Amen. We play hurt. You know, Joan broke her hand. She played hurt. Andrew cracked up his heel. He played hurt. Now I got a broken ankle. So if, if the lesson of this story is don't preach, be a deacon, or play an instrument. <laughs> That's the lesson of this story. <laughs> That's the moral, <laughs> the moral of this story. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me, I want to read uh, a few verses of Scripture here um, for our thinking. First uh, Peter uh, chapter 1. Uh, three through nine, and it says this, Bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If this, in this you rejoice, even even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. I can say amen to that one. So that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that through the perishable it is tested by fire, may be found the result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an undescribable and glorious joy. Now read verse 9. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. I want to use as a thought this morning, radically redeemed, radically redeemed, radically redeemed. And if you allow me this morning, I want to stay at the cross or the theme of the cross for a bit as we move slowly away from the resurrection toward Pentecost. One of the things that we do not do well as a church, and I don't, I mean the church universal, not F-H-U-C-C specifically, we don't do well is we don't sit, reflect, ponder, and hear what the Spirit is saying to us individually and thereby collectively. We like to rush through to get to the conclusions of the matter. Somebody say amen, if if that's true. I have found some of the greatest spiritual teaching moments happen in the midst of trials, calamity, and simply waiting for a word of direction and or clarity from God. And what, what I'm trying to get you to see is this. If we allow Christ, he will sit with us through the struggle. He will talk with you and I in the middle of the challenge. In Christianity, we do a whole lot of waiting. Thank you, Karen. Advent, Lent, and Pentecost. We have to get comfortable with waiting. You got to wrap your mind around that. And I know it's antithetical 
to our right now immediate gratif gratification culture. But the word says, wait, I say on the Lord, wait, I say on the Lord. So we're talking about radically redeemed. Now, the word radical may seem stra a strange pairing to our redemption message this morning. The word radical often takes on a negative connotation. In today's climate, the word radical may conjure up visions of an uninvited, an invited insurrection and an uninvited riots, whether for, be for better or for worse. Radicals are out to fundamentally change their world. In the political arena, there's a whole lot of radicalism going on. The far right is fighting against social reform, while the far left is fighting against the status quo. Each hopes that their fundamental position will bring sweeping change to our nation. Now hear me, it's FHUCC. Each is causing deep-rooted divisions with a winner-take-all, the other side is dumb or outright evil mentality. In a winner-take-all, zero-sum war, nobody really wins. Why? Because radical behavior rules out compromise, and that's not good. The word of God, are y'all still with me? The word of God is clear that unity is the only path to peace. As Christians, we are charged to walk worthy of our calling. We are called to approach each other with lowliness, lowliness and meekness. We are charged to be long-suffering or patient and to forbear or to put up with each other as an act of love for the sake of unity. Now, such expressions of our calling set the table for compromise. The schisms in our nation, in my opinion, now it's not Bible, this is just James, are the result of, of the unwillingness to listen and to wait. Listen and wait. I am still astounded with so many who profess to be Christians in our country that we sure are lacking in the knowledge or willingness to act like we belong to Jesus. First, by listening. Amen, somebody. Amen. Now, listen, the, the body of Christ has much work to do, not just among the folks outside the walls, but in our own house as well. God commands us to live civilly together, work towards peace, and to lay aside every weight and sin that does so be easily beset us. Nevertheless, we are here today, this first Sunday after Easter, waiting on the ascension and Pentecost because we serve a radical God. It was his radical move to redeem humanity that has us sitting in this place of worship today, watching on Facebook Live or YouTube because of what he did. We are here continuing to celebrate Christ's radical move to forgive and take upon himself the trespasses of the world, allow himself to be crucified, dead, buried, and then have the unmitigated goal to get out of the grave Amen. and pave our way our path to redemption. There is no doubt we have been radically redeemed. But that leaves a few questions for me. First, what are we redeemed from? Hmm. Well, personally, I don't want to know, need to know all your past business from your past. I don't even need to know what you've been up to lately because I would be shocked. <laughs> right? You know what they are, right? Maybe... maybe, maybe, maybe you have a problem with being judgmental. Maybe you have a problem with your temper. Maybe you have a problem with honesty. Maybe you have a problem just minding your own ding-dang business. Amen. Amen, somebody. Maybe you don't think you have any problems, but everybody else does. Whatever our issues are, I can tell you that God sees all of our issues. The original idea of redemption or ransom was to be purchased from slavery. However, we were born with this idea that we can save ourselves. I can do it myself. I don't need any help. That's what our tradition or our mindset teaches us. We can clean up our own act. But Peter says in verse 18, you were ransomed from your futile ways inherited by your ancestors. The idea that 
We can be holy without God's redemption is preposterous and downright silly. We cannot shake off our own dirt and its penalties. The proclivities of life have a way of mastering all of us and shackling us with iron chains of habit. The habit of valuing power over people. The habit of greed, the habit of low character, the habit of hatred, the habit of envy, the habit of making excuses, the habit of pride, the habit of rudeness, self-righteousness, bitterness, regret, fault-finding, rebellion, stubbornness, arrogance, failure, and insecurity. The person who commits these things can become a slave to these things. And Peter says, trying to fix it yourself is impossible. In the Greek, he, he says it this way. He says, it misses the mark. It's vain. It's profitless. And it is useless. Now, what are we redeemed by? Peter says in verse 18 and 19, we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish. Or spot. You missed your amen cue. The apostles shared lots of adjectives in their writings to describe our Christ, but I like Peter's favorite one, precious. Peter spoke of a lot about Christ's wondrous sacrifice, but the page is full of superlatives but none more eloquent than the word precious. In verse 7, he says, more precious than gold than perishes. In, in, in 1 Peter 2 and 4, he says, chosen of God and precious. Our chief cornerstone, elect and precious. To, be, to the believer, he is precious. Christ who gives a common precious faith. God, Christ who gives us exceeding great and precious promises. Precious is the perfect word to describe what Christ's death, resurrection, and eventual ascension and sending of the Holy Spirit means to all of us. We were sinking and Christ threw us a lifeline. Christ took away our guilt and shame and replaced it with his glory. The glory of knowing that through Christ we have a new relationship with our God. The glory of knowing that we can accomplish anything through Christ. The glory of knowing that we are free to live fully and authentically. We are redeemed a complete transformation, a total change, a thorough reformation, an absolute turnabout that sets us on a new path. He who owns self bore our sins in his body on the tree. How precious is that Christ? But one more thing I'm going to leave you with. Next question is, what are we redeemed for? In this chapter, verse 17 says, Peter tells us the past our time with, re with reverence. This is a command and it's meant to be a motivational moment. Peter is saying that the revelation of our redemption should not lead us down a path of laid back, laissez-faire, stress-free confidence or indifference. On the contrary, the knowledge of our redemption through Christ's blood should cause us to express reverential awe. And above all, we should fear the idea of receiving the grace of God in vain. In chapter 2, Peter called, has a rallying cry. He says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been radically redeemed, bought with the blood from an untainted source, Jesus the Christ. He has called us from darkness into his marvelous light. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercies has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I know you have issues, First Congregational Church. I have issues. We all have issues, but our identity with Christ is greater than any issue that we could ever have. How lively is your hope? If your hope is in our resurrected Christ, then we ought to be able to praise God for he is almighty and awesome. He is benevolent and brilliant. He is compassionate and caring. He is devoted and divine. He's extraordinarily esteemed. He is faithful. He is faultless and forgiving. He is genuine and generous. 
You should be able to praise him. He is honorable and honest. He is immaculate and inspiring. He is unjust. He is loving and he is lasting. He is mighty, matchless, and masterful. He is noble and needy. He is omniscient, omnipresent, and overwhelming. Perfect and pure. You ought to praise him. He is righteous and redeemed. He is supernatural, superb, sanctified, and superior. He is truthful and trustworthy. He is understanding, unfailing, and unflinching. You should praise him. He is virtuous and victorious. He's wholesome and wise. He is our God. Amen. Come on. That's it. That's all I got on my bad foot. God bless you. Radically redeemed. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet as we go to God in prayer. And I believe by faith that God has heard all of these prayers that we have articulated but God also hears the secret prayers that nobody but you and God have talked about God is dealing with them as well God I just thank you for being faithful that you are a faithful God who hears us when we pray you know exactly where we stand and what we need. God, I thank you for every life and every family that's represented here in this church, on Facebook, on Zoom, watching later on TV, wherever they are, God, that you're everywhere at the same time and you can touch situations. And I believe you are touching those situations right now. You're touching them right now in the name of Jesus. God, the broken places, you're healing. The broken places. The deep wounds that we have been carrying for a long time, you're healing them too. Now, God, may the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us until we meet again in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. I love you all. Good to see you, Brad. It's good to see all of you. It's good to see you, dear one. God bless you.